The Inn River is the lifeblood of the Inuk ruin-born elves and their civilization. In the aftermath of the Day of Ashen Skies, the Inuk Plateau was carved out and its cities annihilated. When the first tribes arrived to the Inn, they found a near absence of precursor relics and ruins, and in time, the precursor elves were forgotten, giving way to other legends, like Lukaus and the Antler Lords, the Ending Flood, and the kingdoms of Malaknar and Varein. In 1444, two centuries have passed since the collapse of the Inuk Empire, albeit its capital, Arverin, still clings on with a claimant to the imperial dynasty. In the south, Sarda is divided into small realms, though the rising star of Trompolere is set on a collision course against the status quo. In the center of the region, Dolinda, the resurgent kingdom of Malaknar sharpens its blades while the lordship of Amachimst first of the feudal old guard, rides to meet the storm head-on. To the west, the Drosmatur cultists still lick their wounds after their failed invasion, but the Duke of Pomvason plans to soon make a move. The Inn River is also the region's main physical obstacle, its strong currents only partially contained by the great Inic dams and the monsters lurking below, make the crossing of armies a foolhardy endeavor. Only the dams provide safe crossing, acting as bridges for armies and priceless strategic points in addition to their economic and religious value. To the south, the Inn River Valley ends abruptly at the Great Cliffs of Ruin, which many Inic ruin-born elves believe to be the end of the world, and can be descended only by building cliff passages at a few key points. To the very north, the Inn River Valley is occupied by the Fey Forests of Rzenta, and the unassailable forest of the Cursed Ones, which open up into the arctic shores of the Broken Sea. Inic society is special in a sense. It places great value on continuity and decentralization, in theory at least. The house of Virekin that rules over Arverin is the legitimate ruler of all the inn. But nobody cares. Most of the land is held by petty lords who only think of themselves. Such a warlord, Alaran of Trompolere, recently defeated Arverin, destroyed their army, took control over the keep of Arvesl and utterly humiliated them. To protect the capital, Lord Calrodi IV threw as much money as he could at Alaran of Trompolere and convinced him to conduct his raisings and pillaging elsewhere. The price paid for safety had further unfortunate consequences, and Calrodi's blunder, as some would call it, cost him the loyalty of his followers. Together with the money from the coffers, the few remaining fighting men threw down their weapons in disgust and left for whatever lands their legs would take them to. The one remaining subject's loyalty also hung in the balance. After such a disastrous defeat, the Yosahar of Tromshana harbored no desire to pay for their overlord's blunder. In 1444, the 010 Sardic Lord of Arverin, Calrodi IV, has hit rock bottom. With the coffers empty and deep in debt, Calrodi could barely afford crude wooden shields for the few soldiers left in the garrison of his depressing city. Bridges and roads were left to crumble. Botanists were looking for employment elsewhere, leaving plants to wilt. Walkways were crumbling beneath visitors' feet. One last time, Lord Calrodi IV asked his populace to help him avenge the humiliation that they endured, and so his tax collectors and guards gathered everything that they could. The Lord himself, standing before a pile of various goods seized from local shops, took off three precious rings that decorated his fingers and threw them in the pile as well, while a guard recited a speech praising the Emperor for his sacrifice, then talked about duty. Duty and sacrifice two terms that were sorrowfully familiar to Arverin's citizens. More guards marched out, moving building by building to collect coins, food, medicinal herbs and anything else of value. Most people complied, meeting the soldiers at the front doors with baskets full of tribute, for great was the power that compelled the Arverinics in their loyalty to the Empire. But even that power had stretched thin, squeezing its subjects dry. And should it be used to take even more, the consequences for Arverin and the Virekin dynasty might be unthinkable. The loot was gathered, but the corruption, unrest and general decay caused by the latest tax run put the Lord in a terrible danger. If revenge would not be achieved soon, 
if Horpanas and Arvesel would not be reclaimed, it would surely spell his doom. Whatever was left of his meager diplomatic clout was gone, and Kalrodi would sit on the throne as a ridiculous 000 monarch. The flaws in the army were self-evident. There would be no charging Inic knights to rally at Arverin's side. The keep at Arvesel was lost, and the Tromshana ranch alone was not enough to raise a strong core to rebuild a severely demoralized army. Prince Karodin proposed a radical alternative, an army based around the Veikodan to the east. They were Buichev, barbarians, but their rune magic made them formidable adversaries, and their exotic saber-tooth and woolly rhino mounts are almost able to compete with the mighty antler horses. While they have always employed small bands of Veikodans here and there, it was time to make them a true part of the army. A few Veikodan tribes agreed to the proposal and flocked to Arverin, but their loyalty came with a set of conditions that would have disastrous consequences if not fulfilled. They also made it very clear that they were interested to settle in the relative safety of civilized Inic lands, and thus, with a deficitary economy and a band of crazy rune-powered barbarians on the front lines, something had to be done to regain standing in Sarda, and fast. With the prince's initiative and popularity being so much higher, Kalrodi I decided to step down and an opulent ceremonial funerary barge was released down the river as it is customary on the inn. The words of House Virekin are strength from order, order from greatness. Kalrodi IV brought hope to the dynasty initially, but he achieved little in the ways of strength. His biggest achievement was saving the city by nearly bankrupting the country with bribes to Alaran of Trompolere. Good luck did shine upon the new Lord Karodin, as Alaran's pride brought his house ruin. The people of the inn have a deeply feudal society and the lords value continuity and decentralization above all else. Using wars to steal lands from other lords is met with heavy pushback and Alaran pushed way too hard, taking lands from both Arverin and their deadly rivals Sanihrada alike. Their latest aggression targeted the great dam at Velsbakar. Even if the Trompolere armies were larger than their individual rivals, Alaran himself, at the head of one of his contingents, was ambushed at Horpanas and killed. His death triggered a rapid collapse, and the recently conquered lands were split between their original owners. This is how Arverin obtained Horpanas back, as well as the lordship over Arvesel. With the debts almost fully repaid, Karodin was ready for battle. A fisher elf in the realm of Lord Karodin has managed to train a remarkably clever otter that is spoken of several towns away. After a local baron witnessed the animal in action and commented that such a talented pet would serve as a gift for even a lord, the fisherman decided to travel to Arverin to present his liege with the otter as a gift. The lord named it Fidra and the people rejoiced. Karodin attacked the lordship of Velspakar to secure the dam, a brutal war that resulted in the subjugation of Stenurin and the seizing of all the lands that were not their capital. Velspakar was also conquered, though the precious infrastructure was damaged by the war. A small price to pay for control of this majorly important stronghold. The first pieces were moved. The Veikodan warriors more than proved their worth on the field of battle. Once the dust settled after the first wars, the Lord decided to show his new allies the respect that they deserved. Veteran mercenaries, or pomentere, were offered vast estates in the countryside outside the capital so that they and their families could live a much-deserved comfortable life. This would entice more and more Veikodan mercenary bands to join the ranks of the Arverin armies with promise of even more estates in the future. The next target in Karodin's sight was the major rival in Sarda, Stanir Hrada. A bit of history. In 674 after Ash, Emperor Daras Tarad I moved the imperial court to Stanir Hrada, where it stayed as a capital for two centuries. Its palace, once a beacon of imperial might, has since been refitted into a castle, which is the base of power of a cadet branch of imperial dynasty. While Arverin had no desire to move the court, the Golden Dome at Stanir Hrada would make a fantastic summer palace. 
The horn was sound and the province was retaken together with the Golden Dome Monument. The lordship itself, as well as Fahevich, were forced into submission. With a gathered imperial authority, Karodin forced the Lord Hrenvir as an heir of Stanir Hrada. This would eventually mend the rivalry between the two family branches, but their current lord would have to first join his ancestors. The newly conquered lands saw the estates of the Buichev expand. Chieftain Rapanach arrived to Adir Falon, or as the people of the valley call it, Arverin. Not one to usually risk death under a rain of arrows shot by the jumpy Sarda, he had nonetheless come to visit his fellow chieftains Sannem and Sronzar. The first thing Rapanach noticed was how much clothing the two of them bore. How was he meant to recognize them now that their vibrant tattoos were hidden by layers of plain cloth? But he did recognize their voices and the runic patterns on their faces and hands. Sanem, Sronzar, at least they don't force you to wear knight's helmets, huh? He joked, expecting a laugh from his old friends, even now that they were captains of the Veikodan guard. And laugh they did, and the three spoke for hours. What do you mean you're not coming back? Rapana asked, suddenly taken off guard. Surely you must have big plans. Retire and found a Veikodan kingdom of your own. Finally get rid of the emperors and sack this city. Grab a souvenir to bring back to your tribe or anything else. Sanem sternly replied, Rapanach, the only thing we plan is a comfortable retirement, settling the lands the emperor has promised us with our families and friends. Rapanach froze for a moment. His old friend's voice was without a hint of sarcasm. What about our people? Rapanach croaked. Rapanach, I'm sorry. Sronzar intervened, glancing at his fellow Veikodan mercenaries and the Sarda peasants traversing the road. This is our people now. And if you continue committing sedition, you might be arrested. Sedition? <sighs> Cursing fate, Rapanach mustered all his willpower to hold back the magical fury that began boiling through his veins and abandoned his friends and their city, their paths having diverged forever. The Veikodans were fully integrated into Sarda society. With Stanirhrada subjugated, Sarda was open for conquests. Arverin warriors set up new Yosahar subjects indiscriminately up and down the inn. Karadin's influence eventually spread all over the region and all lordships would swear allegiance, whether they liked it or not. Strength from order, order from greatness. History Continuity This is one of the ways by which Inic elves find pride, joy and something worth defending. And it is also a way to find where to hurt them the most. Completed in 823 by the abundant finances of the eccentric merchant Dorandir, Sintrandir, the castle of Trompolere houses in its courtyard a tree, from which the tree, Trom, part of Trompolere. The tree is even older than the castle, having been used as a ranger tree house since Sarda's earliest centuries. The winding stairs and silver-lined roofs of the highest structure may be as old as the palace of Stanirhrada, and there is no doubt that Alaran must have spent much of his childhood near this treehouse. Let us burn it then, until nothing is left of it but blackened grass and crumbling twigs and a rain of ashes depositing all over Trompolere's castle town. And so the revenge of House Virekin was complete. To the north, in Dolinda, the fearsome battle lords of Malaknar were not sitting idle. Violent and disciplined, the Malaknari were individually the best warriors along the inn. They would soon face a Sarda, united by the authority of the rightful Inic Emperor. The Antler Horse Cavalry and the Rune Warriors were ready to test their mettle. Until the time would come, they would gather their strength and pay off their dues, reconstruct the dams and rebuild their temples. The time for war would surely come soon. Hrenvir stood over the gold inlaid branches, carefully grown and twisted to form a natural balcony over several decades by the best botanist Emperor Darastarad could find. Above him, the golden dome of Stanirhrada shined as bright as it ever had, and from here he could oversee the entirety of the palace-turned-castle of Stanirhrada, said to be one of the most beautiful fiefs in all of the inn. It lay surrounded by fertile fields and orchards, which provided bountiful harvests thanks to the golden dome he stood under. In the courtyard below, 
the Order of the Dome was dutifully training, loyal to it, and now to him. He had dreamt of standing here for as long as he remembered. Yet he had never expected to look over this domain, his domain, without some sort of miracle. Yet here he stood. Hrenvir had been made heir to Stanir Hrada following his lordship's subjugation by Arverin. Previously a member of a distant branch of House Jemstantir, he had grown up together with Karodin II in the Teal Keep as a ward, becoming good friends and serving under Karodin II as advisor in the years of adulthood. As Hrenvir was looking over his domain, he thought of the future of Stanir Hrada. House Jemstantir was one of the most prestigious dynasties of all Sarda and could directly trace its lineage from the imperial line. Stanir Hrada was one of the wealthiest, largest and strongest lordships of the inn. Other lords may have started planning to revolt against Arverin, but Hrenvir knows that it is unity that brought the inn to its greatest point, that the empire was prosperous thanks to the many loyal Yeosahar maintaining the peace and serving the empire, and that is what Hrenvir will do for so long as he lives. The victories and development of the capital city saw it rise above the decline. The city was healing and various districts were seeing an influx of people who would come to work, create and participate in the life of a renewed imperial capital. The city was blooming anew from fertile soil. The first district to develop was the Havak Bujovek or Foreign Smith District. In larger home affairs, while in most of the inn the administration is performed by feudal lords helped by stewards and castellans, in Arverin the imperial functionaries still diligently aid in the administration. Not only are they trained individuals, but they are loyal to the crown and not tied to the local lands. The number of functionaries was increased with a slow regaining of crown lands from the estates and were supported so that the Lord Emperor could administer the lands more directly. The currency reform also came to pair the administrative reform. Vels Domfan, the green gold mint in the south, the coins it produced from glass that encased a thin strip of gold would be the empire's perfect currency. Beautiful and cheap. Karodir took direct control of Vels Domfan and installed a mint to supply the people with this new wonderful coin. A delegation from Arvesel presented one day an ambitious proposal. Ever since the Third Inic War, the frontiers of the Empire were pushed back by barbarian raids. Border towns were abandoned as their inhabitants sought protection in the hinterlands. On Arverin's river, Arvesel stands as the good river-worshipping Inic's easternmost settlement. Its lord aims to embark on a daredevilish campaign to vassalize the tribes that inhabit the bogs of the Arverin's forks and occupy the fertile farmlands between the Sidin and Heran-in rivers. His plan was meticulous and the economical and prestigious benefits of ruling said area were self-evident. The Emperor agreed and funded the so-called Water Links Strike Force Expedition. Sarda thus gloriously settled Delanidon and Nawirvis. Following the expedition, the Osvoir district expanded. Four, a woman in a linen tunic with aquamarine hair spoke to her daughter as she gave her a piggyback ride through the stalls. That sign means a bag of tomatoes costs 4 glass coins. Our pawpaws instead cost 12 coins a bag, she declared to the bewilderment of her daughter, as her husband pulled a cart with several cases of green oval fruits. Mom, mom, what is that? The child asked, gazing at a performer clad in purple, doing a double backflip above a fountain while daggers flew over him. Oh, that's a jester. Those people make you laugh and you can give them coins, she explained. The performer got back on his feet and caught two daggers in his hands and a third in his mouth before bowing. Several coins were tossed into the fountain's outer pool by people appreciating the jester's play. Those coins actually belonged to the inn river now, and thus the clergy. However, the jester was under contract and to be compensated. The pow pow stall was all set up. A seller of four horned sheep, dairy to its left, and an embroiderer of Inea pig hair to its right. Customers poured like a river into the market square and began purchasing bags of their fruit. Confident with her earnings, the mother left her husband running the stall and took her daughter on a tour of the district. Entering a street, they walked through a lineup of taverns, cobblers, tailors and other kind of shops, which had housings and balconies on the upper floors. 
Some appeal to the higher classes, like a bookstore with a great window in stained purple glass showcasing the interior's fine wooden shelves and gold-studded armchairs. Other were more modest, like a stonework selling floor tiles and garden decorations ran by an old brelari with short combed grey hair and a glittering smile. There were temples blending in with the buildings and doors which led to towers spiraling above the district, linked to the suspended walkways and usually reserved to guards and tour guides. Other businesses, like a certain Brodmuir's Gallery of the Absolute Truths, or a smiling hunched elf with a backpack full of masks, standing in a back alley next to a laboratory whose sign read Bemolas' Ascension Boutique, simply were shady. What they saw was only a small part of what could be found in the Osvoir district, or Open district, which was open to people from all walks of life looking to make a fortune in the big city or simply peddle their wares during a quick stay. The Inic religion is a religion that flows like the eponymous river. Its boons depend on the zodiac and they change from season to season. The worship of the river differs from region to region but has two main tenets. The first is that the river is the one true deity, while all creatures are merely the spawn of it. And the second is that the river carries to the afterlife. As a lord gathers authority by controlling Io Sahar, they can chair debates that develop and enhance the faith. The first great theological debate revolved around the reasons for the downfall of the empire two centuries prior. The Lord insisted that this unity was the cause and that the feudal Iosahar should contribute more to the Emperor's war efforts. Fierce debates raged in the realm. Tournaments and contests of faith and logic were happening all across Sarda. As a distraction, Lord Karodin descended his armies back into Dolinda to subjugate Malaknar, who were crumbling under the weight of their own conquests. The proud Malaknari battle lords were completely taken off guard by the advances of the Sardan knights. With their capital fallen, they disintegrated completely. Arverin took direct control of their former capital, while the rest of the Malaknari territories crumbled and split between their original controlling lords. Disunited, these lords would be easy prey. The dam at Mokbarja held particular interest for the emperor. It was the main gate between Dolinda and Sarda and needed to be secured. This magnificent victory was spared with the successful end of the first debate. And with that, the armies of Arverin grew ever stronger. In the southwest, even if many Veikodans were seeking employment under the Inic lords, many more headed west in warbands to loot and pillage in a savage display of barbarity. Raids from this region date all the way back to the times of Kalrodi the Great, who built Arverin and Fathevic as fortifications near the sites of his two biggest victories against the barbarian chieftains. While the first evolved into a city and the second into a castle, both keep acting as primary fortifications from which the approaches into Sarda are guarded. Further loans were taken and the lands were fortified with new barracks and castle keeps. By strength, the Emperor gave the order and unity was restored. Two centuries of petty lords and betrayals have left Sarda without purpose or loyalty, yet they could not undo the legacy of the Inic Empire, which merely needed to be relearned. To facilitate this, grand councils were hosted, with banquets so sumptuous and performances so dazzling that even the haughtiest nobles would not miss them. All of Sarda has seen the greatness of House Firekin. And among these banquets and feasts, the second debate commenced. The second debate had the fate of the fellow Ruinborn in mind. The question asked if the corrupted Ruinborn were the same as the Inix, or if the dregs along the tributaries were not truly chosen. The Lord argued that they were all chosen by the river's guiding waters, and the debate began in earnest. It went in the crown's favor and ended without much consequence. At the end of the debate, with all the Sahar loyal and kept in check, the conquests could continue in the north. Rzentur forests were dominated by the dragon cult nation of Pombason. Being a monolithic power, the swarm of Inic knights made quick work of the fortifications, regardless of the forests that protected them. Drevkenuk fell soon after and their subjects were confiscated. 
Varein followed in the same manner. Only Lysikalarevo stood defiant, a speck of dust in the north protected by a formal truce. With all of Sarda and Dolinda under control, and with a significant amount of religious authority gained through loyal subjects, Lord Lovank I declared the rebirth of Sarda in earnest. Once the proclamation was declared, the subjects kneeled before the Emperor, and time stood still in hushed joy. The Inic Empire would be reborn. The Swamp Dam of Mokbakar hoisted imperial flags now and the knights of Arganjuzorn were patrolling the route south of it into the heart of the empire. The battle kings were vanquished and their fierce battle guards were now swearing allegiance to the rightful emperor. The knights of the bush, based in Grebnest, protected the hedge gardens in the northwestern reaches of civilization from Erzenturi clan warriors and other beasts. Strength from order, order from greatness. Now the empire had to centralize. The Yeosahar gave up lands time and again. Pomvason, in their greedy ambition, attacked and conquered the final Erzentur duchy. With all dragon cults under control, the Emperor sent a troop of brave men to the city of Svemel to find and apprehend the dragon prince, the head of the worshippers of the dragon Varlengeilt. When the guards encountered him, he had only a smattering of loyalists to protect him. They were easily dispatched and the cult of the dragon was erased from existence forever. Let's set our gaze back on Sarda proper for a second, at Thromshana market side. That's the name of a Yeo Sahar who truly kept their oaths even in the darkest hours, when Alaran defeated the house of Virekin. Now that urgent matters were out of the way, it was time to decree Thromshana the second beneficiary of imperial public works after the capital itself. The market square was renewed and the mayor would be granted audience at the palace to request anything needed for the prosperity of his people. With this, it was formally integrated into Sarda proper and discarded the title of free keep in the empire. As a first infrastructure project to honor the integration of Tromshana, the Tromselok Way project began. This process of slow colonization of a road through the Veikodan wilderness would unify Sarda and Dolinda on the eastern side of the river, bypassing the great river dams so that merchants could travel freely from one region to the other and move more valuable goods and produce. Gazing east from Averin's walls, one would see that the wide open field outside the city extends far in the distance to form the borderlands with Veikoda, known as the Moon Field. It was considered an extension of Munamsto, the Moon City, and a keen-eyed individual can still notice a hillock with a ruined marble temple on top built in the same style as Munamsto's. Left abandoned amid the grassy plains and reclaimed by plants and animals for the last two centuries, it is still decorated with imagery of the moon that summons the inn river to rise, no looter daring to pick it off. Recently, a captain of the Veikodan guard claimed the temple is occupied by Veikodan Buichev, who use it as a base. According to the report, after a run-in with border raiders, he and his troops charged all the way to the temple's defensive walls behind which the raiders took shelter. The soldiers and functionaries were gathered, and they would ride at sunset. After ascending the artificial mount of Moon Karel and exploiting a breach in the outer walls, they stood in front of the columns and debris-laden entryway of the old Moon Temple, known to Veikodans as Setir Deyel. The Veikodan Buichev have retreated deeper into the temple, outnumbered by the troops and the Veikodan mercenaries. Cautiously, the mages disarmed the rune-laden paper sheets the Veikodans have left along the way, and the magical staff banished the darkness from the temple's inner hallways, highlighting a beautiful mosaic of the sun, the moon, and the inn stretching through recurved walls. Only one way led further down, a dusty wooden trap door in a corner by the end of the hallway. The expedition decided that the field would never be truly secured until this temple would be cleared. They went underground and first they faced the Buichev, cutting down many of them easily, but still suffering losses due to the Veikodan's unpredictable magic. Descending another floor, they began to hear the clanking of bones, guttural chants and eerie songs played through wind and percussion instruments. Marching onward, they cut down what seemed to be reanimated creatures, warhounds, lynxes, fowls, rats. They came across a barricaded wooden door, smashing their way in with a powerful tackle by one of the knights. 
What ensued was a fast-firing exchange of magic spells between the mages and cultists. When it was over, most contenders on both sides lay dead, only a few Imperial Knights and Vaikodan mercenaries still standing. Their attention was drawn by the sealed gate on the other side of the room, lined with wine-red leather and silver studs. It seemed not even the cultists' magic could breach it, leaving but a few blast marks. The gate had a small keyhole with a symbol of the teal crest carved in silver next to it. The surviving Imperial troops tacitly made plans to turn back and get help to bury the bodies when another individual stepped into the room. It was Vridal Lovank I. He had something that he had to do there. The decade surrounding Emperor Phineas's death was a chaotic haze, events being blurred together, rearranged and forgotten. The Emperor ever searching for an innovative solution to bring his empire back from the brink enlisted mages from near and far. Most promising among them, Doukan Zrim, an affable old Vekodan with slender body and a captivating smile, skillful with people as he was with substances. Doukan Zrim enticed the Emperor with his ideas to negate inequality and soothe the spirits of Arverin's populace. However, at the time when he was needed the most, Dokan Zrim fled and placed a spell on the populace to cover his tracks, leaving the Emperor at the mercy of his own frenzied subjects. Continuing to read through the Imperial archives, one will learn that Kanvel, the defunct Emperor's sister, repeatedly accursed Dokan Zrim for the disappearance of several items, including the Virekin's personal keys, several tons of dame steer, but also people and animals. Most ominously, the Emperor's pet otter, which went missing exactly one year before Phineas's death. It is also believed that he fled to Munkarel, the same monastery Canvel was exiled to, using the Virekin keys to access the deepest levels of the dungeon and make it into his hideout, playing a part in its eventual fall. With these thoughts in mind, Vridal Lovank I launched an expedition into the Moonfield using the pretext of Vekodan raids as a simple excuse to bring vengeance to the Virekin family, finally unearthing the secrets beneath the Moon Mound. Step after step, Lovank I descended the stairways that led into the darkness of Mooncarel's final level. More than a level, it was an underground cave with its own small ecosystem. Whether this was the work of the Mad Mage or his Imperial ancestors, it was not for Lovank to say. A chattering sound soon greeted Lovank I and his knights, along with a splash of running water from an underground brook. A torch was lit up and what they saw was not a peerless arcane mage, but something equally startling, a chimera, a creature made from the amalgamation of several others. It had the tail of a beaver, the webbed feet of an otter and the billed head of a duck. Several of them were crawling through the cave, feeding on little spiders, bug eggs and crayfish. My Vridal, please stand back! I will dispose of this accursed creature if you just give the word," one of the knights said, sword unsheathed, as he stood between Lovank and the nearest creature, which was wordlessly staring at them. By the Emperor's decree, these bizarre creatures were not to be harmed though. The East rumbled, a stampede of woolly rhinos heralded the rocking of royal carriages, sturdy wheels, rolling onwards as the Vekodan elites riding on top led the beastmasters and painted warriors to war. Several rows of Puichev formed on the horizon and threatened to swallow the moonfield. A cacophony of shouts, both male and female, was heard as the Inic soldiers and settlers hastily retreated to the monastery trying to reinforce its gates and fill the breaches with whatever objects they could find. Malaknari captain was leading the defense, and he emboldened the spirits masterfully. In his heart, the captain was thankful to the fates for giving him such a picturesque stage for his last stand. Two soldiers muttered something as they sat by one of the tower stairs. They weren't supposed to be here, they had volunteered just to see the moonfield and maybe shoot a few barbarians, but why did it have to come to this? Furor gave way to confusion and tension gave way to laughter as everyone looked up to see Vridal Lovank I holding a creature half waterfowl and half rodent from the temple walls, while a flutist played a melody familiar across cultures. A tradition of Vekodan Ruinborn, which in river worship sometimes appropriated, was the Song of Dawn, 
which announced the discovery of a new species and called for the interruption of almost any activity, whether fighting or sleeping, to hold celebrations. A truce was negotiated with the Vaikodan elites, and they were welcomed as guests into Moon Karel's courtyard. While Sarda bards tried their best to smooth tension, Inuk farmers lay out tables with produce and rune scribes designed an area as the Field of Games. Rhino Leaping, Tug of War, Chan K, and even a dreaded lacrosse match did see the Inuk knights pitted against tribal champions of the East. Members of the Vaikodan guards stood aside at first, for not everyone of their kin looked favorably upon their career. But as festivities mounted up, tensions mellowed, and they soon joined the dancing and singing until the moon was high up in the sky. So, what should we call the animal? A river priest asked Vridal Lovank I. I don't know, he replied. Not sure whether a portmanteau or punny name would be better. They were, however, interrupted by a commotion from within the temple. As one robed individual emerged, everyone froze up. There was no mistaking it, though Kanzrim had awakened. He spat foul words, Curse you, bury the once otter, and launched a glowing azure sphere against the emperor. However, one of the newly discovered creatures swiftly jumped up and imbued of the same magic, swung its tail to deflect the attack back at the mage who fell to the ground and finally croaked. Bury. I think that's what I'll call this one. The vast plains around the capital were repopulated at great cost to the state, but the loyalty of the people was self-evident. Development in the capital continued to grow. Inuk society, save for the capital, is essentially agricultural. The unwritten rules of commerce and conflict resolution between farmers were more or less respected by emperors and lords throughout the short Inuk history. With agriculture becoming a source of pride once again, and with the increasing interest of traders, these rules were coded into a farmer's law, or Zalagon Pananek, so that the people could be safe and secure in that their dealings will be treated fairly by the state and by each other. The Previdence system was a system of land division established by Arverin in the decades following the wars of the Bakaran succession. A Predvis was a grant that temporarily transferred fiscal rights to an individual or institution. Most commonly taxes or incomes from cultivated lands, seldom water or fishing rights, or customs collection. Rights over a piece of land could be distributed to different individuals, so each neighbor would have the rights to their piece of owned land. This right would grant possession and not ownership, which belonged to the emperor. Built upon the Zalagon Pananek, existing feudal laws and experience handling Pomentere estates since the formation of the Vaikodan Guard, the system was innovative but still firmly feudal. This did allow Arverin to restructure the estates when needed, but for Sarda, the system was outdated and had to be changed for increasing centralization and professionalism. With the new laws and land reforms, there was once more a flourishing imperial capital in the inn. Sorrow over a past era was fading from the streets, as beaming decorations were draped from the houses and verdant walkways swayed over the waves of visitors below. Enterprising traders, perusing dignitaries, carefree townsfolk with their children and a new generation of artists. In the day, one could purchase cranberries from Stenurin and cloth from Lukausta, hire the services of hedge knights from Grebniest and runic mercenaries from Vathres. They heard hammers clash and pulleys turn, as southern stone was lifted to build more and more districts. But a strange and dangerous thing began to lurk on the edges of the empire. Foreigners from lands that the Inix never imagined existed were at the gates. Armand's carriage crossed the stone bridge and headed northwest towards a great ring of walls spanning the horizon. He gazed at the setting sun and a warm wind blew through his hat and the seatings of his carriage as he absently listened to the chatter of his companions. When I'll be done with these ruined born, they'll call me emperor and I'll have a concubine for every hair color. A brawny, rowdy redhead spoke. I don't think Sarda ladies will be interested in your advances, if they're anything like the elven women back home. A brunette boy with a cape and glasses promptly joked, sporting a grin. What about you, Armand? The clanking of the city gates interrupted them, and past the guard post they peered at Arverin's interior. 
A wide street was lined up with tall houses decorated in wavy serpentine patterns and sprawling trees with leaves and flowers skillfully cared for. The street continued for kilometers, at times surrounded by pristine tall structures and overarching ropeways, a time lined up with nothing but humble grass, as it winded through the Karel Mounds, over which Arverin's districts were distributed. One Karel stood taller than all, making the rest figure as lower city. It was Virisar Hill, atop which was a castle known to the locals as Drelven Vesel, the Teal Keep. People traversing the streets were both magical and mundane. Pointy-eared city guards in glimmering mail somberly watched traders of colorful robes, accompanied by pet dogs or carts full of wine drawn by antlered creatures. The strike of a hammer and the spark of a furnace were followed by a glow of magical energy. Ominous squires came from places of worship, and you could see folks sporting a bat nose, tribal paint and ivory necklaces, true to the Canorian conception of Ruinborn. Arverin was a city of beauty, and while beauty alone does not deter human greed, the would-be conquerors somberly understood that the legend they were trying to take on still bore a similar magnitude as the inviolable glades of Yorelen, or the booming metropolis of Anbenkost. Armand Silsonkost and his companions went to work mapping the terrain with the help of a few Malaknar rookies while the Empire began to debate the handling of relations with the new neighbors. The Emperor declared that the backwards people know nothing of the inn and the discussions began. At the end, Pomvason stood defiant but was quickly brought to heel by the rest. The same scenario repeated once the later debate regarding the adoption of Canorian fire guns was organized. Pomvason just wouldn't cooperate. That would have had to be addressed sooner or later. In the meantime, the Tromselok Way has been slowly cleared of threats and the number of outposts grew. Some even turned into villages that made a living servicing the ever-increasing numbers of travelers and merchants. Due to continued reports of raids and Wendigos, a force of rangers was organized to patrol the area. The Thromshana rangers used the finest of steeds from their ranch specialized in the smaller breeds, excellent for the rough lands the Tromselok Way winds through. Now that the way was open, the Thrombakar Dam was within day's reach from the capital. It was only natural that it would be integrated directly into the Empire, so that the trade through this causeway would directly benefit the Crown. The Dolindans were the first to unite the Inix into one Empire, and it was Varein who first united the Dolindans. Now Varein was standing as a testament to the tragedy of the Dark Ages. Reduced to a mere town, it is not even the true capital of its own state. That honor goes to the castle of Varein Amak in its countryside, while the imperial capital with its wide streets and its arched pathways alongside its half-finished hippodrome is left to decay when not outright pillaged for stone. The Sardans did what Varein's petty lords could not and it was now time to incorporate the original capital of the empire back into the realm. The Canorians were cunning but disunited. They were circling around Sarda but one by one they fell to the ruinborn elves. First the Bardswood Band, then the Chiptooth Company, the Istralorian Crusaders to the north, and also the Bagalbari Dwarves who were turned into a Yeosahar. A fortunate encounter with the House of Pelodir and the return of the Elves to the new land allowed the Havaloon Quarter to be reopened. The Havaloon Quarter was accompanied by the adoption of the Canorian Institution of Colonization. Time has passed and that little cypress in the Havak Buoyvek district had grown into a towering tree, its slender branches rising skyward like spires supporting suspended buildings, walkways and offices carved within the trunk. Sir Ardohi looked up at the tree. It was still the cypress sapling from Del Narin Grove, yet something had changed. A faint glow on its leaves, a kind sway on its branches. Ardohi's gaze wandered onward from the treetop to a suspended walkway of blue and violet craft that connected it to the isolated corner of the district. Havaloon, that was the name of the quarter that recent immigrants from Krachnor set up. Like the rest of the Havak Puyovek, Havaloon's inhabitants practice smithing above all crafts. Yet the similarities ended here. From the exterior, the quarter figured like a little castle with cloud-white walls and deep blue roof tiles hiding the inner buildings from sight. Even the walkway that connected into said walls was blocked at the battlements 
by a smaller gatepost and an enchanted door. One look at Havaloon's trees springing above the walls and notice they were similar yet different from the one seen in the inn, like otherworldly kin with canopies imbued in a glaring magical aura that at times glowed in blue, at times in gold. Ardohi wondered if he should file a complaint to the city's authorities as the glow of Havaloon's trees was seemingly spreading to their cypress, confident he could leverage his connections with the arena masters. A Yinik noble with rattling armor passed through the district atop his clopping steed covered in barding, crossing the little moat before stopping at Havaloon's gates. The gates were raised for him and he marched in, no doubt looking to have his armor enchanted by the new competition. Compared to Veikodan runesmithing, Havaloon's enchantments were less powerful, but at the same time they required less maintenance. They swiftly earned a good fame among Enic elites thanks to its smith's own skill at self-advertising. Labors of love and years of craft, they called them, and indeed seeing entire units of retainers and castle wardens don these enchanted armors could reassure their commanders like few other things. Yet Ardohi couldn't help but feel bothered. Those smiths have been here for barely a generation and already they could earn a corner of Arverin with the Emperor's approval? The Inic Empire ruled the inn for six glorious centuries. It united and defended the known world, bringing order and justice. And the great dams built during its heyday as well as the landmarks gracing its three largest cities are a testament to its power and to the benevolence of its emperors and they were what Sarda needed to reclaim its legacy. With the entirety of the inn under control, the dynasty of Vikedin officially declared the rebirth of the empire with joy and celebration all across the river and its tributaries. The former capital of Svemel in the Zentur forest was also formally integrated into the empire where it truly belonged. The encroaching Canorians were being subjugated one after the other. Their small adventure bands were not as large as to be included in the Io Sahar system, with a few exceptions, like the Stone Dwarves of Bagalbar. In the northeast, Amachimst was fortified to stand against the horrors roaming the forest of the Cursed Ones, and through the increased authority, the Inic religion was fully reformed. By right and by might, the Inic rule was restored, from Visamto to the high city of Abdrabohvi by the edge of the world. The imperial banners of the teal crest and the vermilion steed flew in every city, if they can truly be called cities in the same vein as Arverin. Like the beautiful Arverin that needed decades of love and care to flourish into the city it was before the age of the petty lords, generations would pass before Varein and Visamsto are to be truly called jewels. Greatness would have to wait for order as they continued the process of strengthening their ties with their most loyal vassals, settling the matter of unitary policies for them all. By the end of it, their power would be an insurmountable crashing wave, with the strength to drown nations, but also birth new life and grow prosperity like never before. They would see an empire reunited, a religion reformed and a dynasty reinstated. And with the final reform of the religion, the age of primitive feudalism was over and the way into a golden future was open. Canorian encroachment, while a threat to their stability, presented an opportunity like never before. For centuries, Inic emperors labored to bring the Veikodan overlands into the empire, attempting to establish a Pansvovich, a lordship of the east. That would bring their borders to the southern cliffs and the eastern mountains. Hearing about the new states and the households forming at the frontiers, many Inic courtiers have started whispering dreams of eastward expansion once again. Eventually, civilization was brought to the east, with colonization expeditions and the conquest of the squatting humans, dwarves and half-orcs. Between puffs of tobacco and sips of holy tea, enjoying a rest at a lounge decorated with Canorian curiosities, Advisors were discussing the best approach for ruling the conquered lands, aware that many times in Inic history, Veikoda appeared all but subjugated only to then rise up and violently throw off all imperial authority. Past emperors learned that marching vast armies in the region was futile. Entire villages of barbarians would disappear only to reappear as vengeful hordes to siege down cities. 
Canorian governments are more stable than tribes, but they change rulers just as fast and skirmish with each other. The decision was made to create strong ties with Pagalbar, the dwarven adventurer state, and reorganize them into a march to keep the others in check. The advice was to show priority in contacting the dwarven workers and take their side in territorial disputes. They bestowed the Bagalbari with a special title of Viced Pomemnik, Helper of the East, making them a linchpin of Inic rule in Veikoda. With the dwarves on their side and the myriad of vassal states on the frontiers, the Emperor decided to finally put an end to Inic diplomacy and the Eosahar system entirely. True centralization was within grasp. Formalizing the decision enraged the existing Eosahar, who rose up in rebellion. To their sorrow, they were shut down. They believed the empire to be surrounded, but they were surrounded in turn and finally fell, trampled by the antlered imperial steeds and shut down by Canorian guns. Due to the rapid expansion into the southeast, the flow of Veikodan mercenaries and adventurers dried out and was replaced by refugees pleading for the emperor to intervene. While many were celebrating this ironic twist of fate, these events risked spelling the end of the valued Veikodan guard. The most cautious advisors suggested that the Kanorians make no difference between Buichev and Inik, seeing both as natives who need to be exterminated for the glory of their nations and that when Veikoda is over they will turn on them. The refugees were then granted lands to form an autonomous duchy on the edges of the cliffs where they could farm and live protected by imperial decree. The mercenary veterans then decided to rally behind the ideas and moved from their Pomentere estates in the empire to a new nation of Viceda, where they could be able to create a little paradise of their own together with their brethren. In time, the empire would encompass all the lands from the Broken Isles to the north to the Trolls Bay to the south and from Eordand to the forest of the Cursed Ones. The end. Wow, that was a mouthful. If you're still here, I hope you sleep well and I didn't wake you up. If you're not yet sleeping, thanks for listening until the end. This region of the map was mostly a colonization target for the Canorians, with Reveria being most interested in running along the river. As it has no clear parallel to the real world, the Inix are a bit alien and strange, and it's difficult to figure them out from the exterior. With a new addition of the Arverin mission tree and the tons of flavor texts added to it, the area has really taken shape in a grand fashion. I wanted to pay tribute to the work of the localizers and thinkers who put this together. Through them, the magical tree house cities of the inn have grown to a blooming start. There is even more flavor in the idea sets, but I will not discuss three sets of ideas for a single nation. This video is long enough as it is. They all handle vassal play better or worse, with the Inic Imperial ideas being probably the strongest with a secondary focus on cavalry. The region is a microcosmos, completely cut off from the rest of the world for quite some time, even when the plague of adventuring states arrives around them. The Eosahar system is pretty cool and seizing lands from subjects seems to be a primary intended way of expanding. They also have a tendency to conquer each other when you don't pay attention. Seizing lands seems to work pretty well in my experience. I also think it's important to vassalize the spawning Canorians instead of installing new Eosahar so that they can aid in the final dismantling of the Enic diplomacy, if we choose to do so. One sad aspect is that there is no way to remove the urban decline debuffs present in all cities along the river, only in the capital through a mission. The rest will stay as they are severely hurting development and blocking the upgrade of monuments for a long time. The mission tree of Arverin does use the shifting reward system from the Origins expansion, but it does not have a clear end. The final missions give a middle-of-the-road set of rewards. Uniting Sarda or forming the Inic Empire does not expand the mission tree, and that's okay, maybe it's the intended way to stay like that. But in my case, the final destination was marked by the decisions to reform the religion and dismantle the Eosahar system. From there on, it's a pure sandbox. One note about the relics of the Virekin mission. This requires you to have some gold in the bank and then starts an event chain to create a powerful artifact. This is a bit frustrating because if you choose the more powerful options, you will bankrupt the country, guaranteed. Because the costs scale with your income and they are extremely high. I understand that it shouldn't be easy, but it does seem a bit extreme, especially for a nation that is in debt for most of the game and is barely able to make any money 
while wanting to upgrade the local monuments for an extra cost imposed by the urban decline debuff present in all urban Terran provinces. I have only presented maybe half of the new events specific to Arverin and the region, but I think I painted a decent enough picture of what's going on here. I hope to see more of this type of storytelling in the future. It was quite a treat and it compelled me to document it even if I had slightly different plans. It was very interesting and I thank the people who worked on it. And with that, I will give the traditional nod to my patrons and channel members. So, thank you Baconomics, thank you Michael VR, thank you Casimir Overell, thank you Old Toby, thank you Darth Mozart, thank you Thorsmane, thank you Alex, thank you Jacob Rubin, thank you Shredded Paper Plate, thank you Bloop Forex, thank you Peter Mushinsky, and thank you Deppert. See you all next time. Ciao.